Having reported on the goings-on at Queen's Park for three and a half decades and having written books about the players there going back six decades, I can tell you this, there has never been a week like the week they've just experienced at the Old Pink Palace. A leader bounced from his job over a sex scandal. A new leader taking over, wanting the permanent job, then acknowledging the interim job will be so hard he should check his ambitions to be premier at the door. And a new leadership race so bizarre, almost all of the contestants appear to be people who've never been elected provincially. To consider this unprecedented time in Ontario politics, we welcome interim PC leader Vic Fideli, who is smiling already. He's the MPP from Nipissing. It has anything going on these days, Vic? It's been a quiet week. Been a quiet Steve. week. Hasn't is this it? what it's like to be interim leader? Uh, Ho hum. Apparently. Let's start with the news of the day. Uh, we have now learned that May 10th is going to be the day that you are going to crown your new leader. Is that right? No. March 10th. March 10th. There we go. March 10th. Which raises this obvious question. How are you going to do in five weeks what parties normally take nine months to do? Uh, it's going to be challenging, but I uh, know that the candidates that are talking about running, uh, they're going to have a very aggressive schedule. Get ready for no sleep candidates because uh, they will be out uh, every day, all day, and this is all they're going to be doing. There was some appetite to restrict the candidacies to only those who are current MPPs or those who are nominated to run in the next election. Ultimately, they decided not to do that. Do you think that's the right move? Uh, look, I think it needs to be broad and open and fair. And I know this is an exclusive decision of uh, first the executive committee and then this, uh, the, the leadership committee that they, that they have formed. And I, I think that's, uh, to have a wide open field, I think that's absolutely the way to go. I mean, they were sort of nicknaming it the Doug Ford rule. The idea being you've got to be nominated or an MPP to run. He isn't either, therefore they could have kept him out. So you're content with him seeking the nomination? Look, I'm content with everybody that uh, is eligible uh, to, to, to be able to run. I, I just believe that that needs to be fair and open and uh, uh, ha this has to happen this way. We are going to bring some figures up here. This is uh, information from Greg Lyle who heads up the Innovative Research Group and he did some polling literally five, six days ago. So these are very fresh numbers. And there we go. Just I would urge everybody at home, ignore all the colorful <laughs> bars in the middle. Just go to the right hand column. And this is where he compares the favorability versus the unfavorability of various leadership potential aspirants. And Christine Elliott, who has, of course, twice sought the leadership in the past, has the highest net favorable right now at plus 26. Lisa Raitt is next. She's not running. There's you, Vic Fideli, at plus 13. Lisa McLeod is next. She's not running. Caroline Mulrooney at 9. John Baird, he's not running. Rod Phillips, who almost certainly will run. Denzel Minnan Wong, who almost certainly won't run. Uh, I, I mean, I've got to ask this. Doug Ford's on that list at minus 26. Uh, do you want a candidate in this race who's at minus 26? Well, I think everybody should, uh, will have the right to uh, uh, enter into the race. And once they start uh, 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 the race and start getting out in the media and start talking about what the role mm -hmm. would be, I, I think the numbers will adjust. Uh, up, down, sideways. Uh, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm not a big guy with the polls. I, I just know that uh, we need to have a spirited race and a, and, a, and, a, and a decent race as well. How disappointed are you? I mean, inside, how disappointed are you that you're not going to go for the brass ring? Look, Patty, my wife Patty and I, we, we talked this all through back in 2014-15 when, when we jumped into that race. This time when uh, this all came down and I'd started hearing from caucus that, look, we want to make you the interim leader. Six phone calls that night, six phone calls that morning. We've already had half of caucus started. Uh, all right, I'm going to take over the role of interim leader. And quite frankly, at the time, it was with the expectation to take the party into the election. I was, we'd made our commitment, we're satisfied. The executive felt different. They felt they wanted to get into a race. I absolutely fully support the executive. So I needed to pick a lane. I knew in my heart, you cannot stay as interim leader and run in a leadership race. That would be, never mind the fact that it would be seen to be wrong, having that advantage, it would be wrong, plain and simple. Well, so I had to pick a lane. And the lane you picked is to do what? Is to stay as interim leader. And, Which means what? Uh, I am What's the, your mission? Uh, I believe that uh, my mission is to A, get the systems in place to make sure that we can have a fair and robust leadership race uh, and get the systems in place that we can, once we have a leader emerge, that 
everything is good to go, everything is working absolutely perfectly, that we've got a full team, great uh, list of candidates, we can go into a June 7th election. So I want to have us election ready. And, and, and the reason I decided to choose that, I'm not entirely convinced that we were there. Let me do one more on this, which is, you of course remember back to the federal Conservative Party situation, Stephen Harper left, Ronna Ambrose from Alberta came in, took the temporary interim leadership, did a great job. She took that position on the condition she not run for the permanent leadership. A lot of people wanted her to renounce that commitment that she made because they really liked her, thought she did a great job. Yeah. Mr. Fideli, what if history repeats? What if a lot of people start coming to you in a few weeks and saying, you know, Vic, you've really got us cooking with gas here. Come on, renounce your previous commitment, go for it. No, no, absolutely not. Look, uh, I genuinely believe uh, my role for the party, for the good of the party, look, there was a lot of soul searching. And I'll be blunt, I put my own personal aspirations aside. Of course, who wouldn't want that role? Who wouldn't want to be there? I have the, the expertise to do it in my own opinion anyway. Mm -hmm. And by the 11 or 1200 emails that I received, but I really think they need a firm hand right now, absolutely at this time, right now, inside the leader's office to fix the system that needs some fixing and make sure all the great tools are in place. We have one opponent for June 7th, and that's Kathleen Wynne, and I want to put the tools in place to bring relief to families. Here's where it gets tricky, okay? Sheldon, bring this graphic up, will you? Mr. Fideli, straight ahead over there. Patrick Brown's picture, of course, was there when the People's Guarantee came out. And now, essentially, all of the people who are leadership aspirants, I guess, are going to be expected to embrace this document, holus bolus. I mean, that is what your um, leadership election organizing committee has mandated, that whoever wins the party leadership has to embrace the aims of that document. H how is that possible? Well, uh, the actual people's guarantee is the written version of the, uh, of the 139 uh, uh, rules and regulations, if you will, uh, uh, that, that, our, that our grassroots members wrote. They, we worked for a year with our membership. This is the most widely uh, 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 sought uh, uh, mem uh, details that we could get. I, we put I, this together and then they you. voted on yeah, it. I have to interrupt you long enough just to say, because I always do this, full disclosure, my wife was a participant yeah. in that process. Yeah. She co-chaired the health panel that yes. brought the health uh, resolutions yeah. forward and were voted on. Yeah. But that's my point. You've been through a lengthy process yeah. as a party and the leader, of course, the old leader, Patrick Brown, signed on to all of that, yeah. was the embodiment of all yeah. of that. And now you've got the possibility of a new leader who did not participate in that process at all, expected to take that document to the people in June. Well, How's our, that gonna work? Our membership participated so uh, uh, in such great detail. And then the membership actually voted. I think it was 139 uh, uh, resolutions that they actually voted on that were adopted by our membership, and they were you know, wordsmithed into the People's Guarantee, and, and we took what their intentions okay, were and made it into... you're not speaking to my question, which is, how is a new leader who had no part in that process, like let's say a Doug, a Doug Ford wins, he had no part in any of that, how is he expected to sort of embrace this document and run on it, having not had any part in it? So they're expected to embrace the 139 uh, uh, items that were voted on, mm -hmm. as opposed actually to the document. The document has the, mm -hmm. the, the, the pretty pictures and the words, but they are expected, that's part of the rules, that they will know when they sign on as a, as a leadership contestant, one of the rules says you will, uh, you are expected to uh, uh, honor the... Uh, actually, uh, the word is the aims of. Yes. The word in the, in yep. the whatever it is, yep. it's not the Constitution, yep. it's yep. the rules, I guess. The, yep. you, have to, you have to embrace the aims of. Yep. Okay, again, Doug Ford yeah. is against a carbon tax. The aims of the convention are for a carbon tax. How does that work? So two things in my opinion. One, uh, I think that's a great question for uh, the uh, public and the members mm -hmm. to be asking all leadership candidates, where do you stand on, on our, our policies? Where do you plan on uh, uh, fulfilling the aims of what the membership asked for? But secondly, uh, I think it's R35, Resolution 35, if I remember correctly, basically said, we will dismantle Kathleen Wynne's cap and trade. We will uh, get out of the Western Climate Initiative uh, for lots of reasons. Uh, we talk about what the Auditor General said, most of the benefit will go to Quebec and California, not uh, Ontario. So we'll get out of that. 
and that we will honor Justin Trudeau's mandated carbon tax. I mean, it is the law of the land. Comma, yeah. but we will return 100% of that money back to the people through a 22.5% income tax cut for middle class, 12% reduction in hydro rates, 75% uh, of daycare that will be paid, and the list goes on and on. Got it. So, so that's, the, that's our guidelines. For, for any candidate to seek the leadership, they must pass muster through your central committee. They must be vetted by the committee by March yeah. the 9th, and therefore, and after that, they're good to go. Can Doug Ford pass a vetting process when he has publicly come out against carbon pricing? Well, that'll be a question between, I, I won't be involved, and that'll be a question between the, uh, the committee that will have this uh, conversation with Doug, uh, Doug or any candidate, all candidates for mm -hmm. that matter. And, and again, they must sign on to the, you're right, the aims uh, of that. The, the grassroots get to vote. The grassroots already voted uh, on what they believe our best policies are. So it will be interesting. Here's a little, Same people. A little smart Alec follow up here. The grassroots really didn't vote on it. 4,000 people voted on it. I mean, the party claims to have 200,000 members, 4,000 people voted on it. Can you really say those policies, those resolutions represent the hearts and minds of the grassroots? They all had the opportunity to vote on it, at least. Well, that is true. Let's move on. You had a bit of an eventful press conference at <laughs> Queen's Park earlier this week. Uh, I won't say it. Let's, uh, let's just quote you in your own words, shall we? <laughs> Roll the clip, please, Sheldon. Our party structure is in much worse shape than we knew. You've all heard there are concerns involving our internal reporting, membership lists, and the security of our information technology systems. Fixing this, and it needs fixing, will be a massive undertaking but it is absolutely essential and absolutely doable if we're to win the next election. I'm giving you my word here today that I will fix the problems in our systems in my role as leader, and I will root out any rot that has been manifesting itself. Everybody wants to know what you're referring to <laughs> by the any rot you referenced there. Well, I can be, uh, you know me, I'm a very blunt guy. I'm a lifelong entrepreneur. I'm a business person. I tell it like it is. And so that interview probably shocked a lot of reporters, uh, but it's the way I am. I'm going to be open and transparent. I certainly did not like uh, what, what the, the status of our structure. Uh, I am primarily referring to our, our computer system, our, you know, these questions of our membership list, the questions about uh, all, all of the issues that, that have been in the press since I, uh, before I made that announcement. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we did have uh, a ransomware attack and we did have questions on our membership. So what I am saying is if there are issues, they are going to be fixed, A, before the leadership race finishes mm -hmm. so that I can turn a full uh, functioning uh, system over to the new leader uh, and uh, all of our candidates can uh, reply, rely on a very robust system backing them up and it just wasn't there. In the rules that I saw today, candidates for the leadership are expected to spend $25,000 to get the voting list out of the party. The voting list, as you know, Mr. Fidelli, is a piece of garbage right now. Nobody knows what it is. Why would anybody pay 25 grand for a list that has no resemblance to the truth? I have already launched a complete investigation, a forensic audit, if you will, into that list. Again, my style, while I'm interim leader, I am open and transparent. Uh, people have heard what I had to say. They're shocked by it. They understand there are issues. I'm going to continue to tell them how we're fixing the issues, what, what we found the issues really to be. I'm going to be blunt when the information comes out. Okay, I promise well, you that. Be, bl be blunt with us here. Patrick Brown used to say he signed up 200,000 people to join the Ontario PC party. We've heard other people say mm, it's probably closer to 75,000. What do you say? Uh, I, am, I am looking into it completely. I am not 100% satisfied with, that we're uh, at, the, uh, at the higher number. Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard three numbers. I've had three reports already. I'm working on it. I will be, when I know what the number is, I will be out with it and what we're going to do about it, how we got there and what we're going to do. We've launched a complete uh, forensic uh, investigation into that. Uh, also, we've already hired uh, uh, IT and security people to come in and make us a more robust compu uh, computer system. And we're putting a separate computer system in place for this uh, leadership race. That's a, that's a sort of a two-month package. I get you. I, I want to know how much confidence you can possibly have in this new system, given that your 
Leadership Election Committee has decided that the votes will be tabulated online. It's not a handwritten yep. ballot. They're going to vote online. You've already had an attempted hack on your computers. There is, from my phone calling out right now, a very low degree of confidence in the party's ability to put a fail-safe system in place so that when people vote online, they have confidence that their vote actually counted. I am completely confident because this has nothing to do with our system. This will be a completely independent outside source that we are outsourcing to do that, uh, the absolute entire voting package. Unhackable. It's well, I would hope so. I would hope that that's... I know you uh, hope so, but that's you... What, that's, uh, this, is the system, this is a company that does this, that has uh, impeccable credentials and, re uh, and reputation. I want that package. Uh, when we were asked for the money from the, um, uh, from the uh, uh, leadership committee at our fund meeting, it was given. Plain and simple. Okay. Nobody got in the way of this. They asked for X amount. We gave them X amount. Done. I wonder whether part of that rot that you referred to at your news conference that you intend to root out are, I mean, one of the things I guess we learned over the past seven days is that the previous leader had some skeletons in his closet that a lot of people didn't know about. And I wonder if part of that rot that you're rooting out right now involves a more thorough vetting of not only leadership candidates, but anybody who's going to put their name on a ballot for the PC party going forward in the June 7 election. Steve, I'm looking at every single role of our party system, everything, every aspect, whether it's memberships, whether it's uh, uh, our candidates, whether it's the financing. And by the way, we've never, ever, ever been in better financial shape as we are today. In the history of our entire party, we've never been in better financial shape. Thank Patrick Brown for that, well, I think. And, and, you know, you have to give thanks where thanks is due, mm -hmm. I, I can tell you. Uh, uh, so it's a complete analysis of every single thing. There will be no stone unturned. When we turn this party over to our new leader, we want to be able to have that leader, whoever it is, go out uh, with a single focus, and that's to talk to the people of Ontario about bringing them relief. Do you know Alex Nuttall, the Barry MP? No. Okay. He, I mean, he made quite an extraordinary statement on Wednesday of this week when he said that he thought that the emergence of this story about Patrick Brown, who, of course, also from Barry was an inside hack job done by Conservatives to oust Brown from that position. Any knowledge of that? <laughs> no, I can tell you that. Do you reject what his characterization of this is? Absolutely. Patrick Brown resigned. Period. He resigned. Well, Pe period. After, after all of his staff came to him and said he better do it, or, or they would, and they did. Well, at the end of the day, he made the decision to mm -hmm. resign. And, and that's what he did. But and, the, I, and I think he made the right decision, by the way. But did the story come out because inside insider conservatives wanted him. I mean, this is what Nuttall is saying, that insider conservatives who didn't like Brown, didn't want him as the leader, essentially double-crossed him. Yeah, I, I just don't take any, uh, uh, anything uh, seriously that, that, in that entire whole, in that entire sentence. That just doesn't make any sense to me. Okay. I, I think he called us Toronto elites or something. Yes, he did. You know, uh, our party is comprised primarily of people like myself in Northern Ontario, rural Ontario. Uh, I think it would be pretty, somebody would be pretty hard pressed to look at, you know, the, pretty much all of our caucus and ever consider us Toronto elites. Our, 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 our constituents at home would be chuckling over that, to be quite frank. I, I have to ask you about another guy. Rick Dykstra, of course, is the former president of your party, having just resigned, again, with a sex scandal, which he denies and which has not been tested or proven in court uh, over his head. Uh, he's still on the PC party executive. As the past president, he's entitled to sit on that committee and help make decisions about the future of your party. Should he be there? I think, uh, like uh, Patrick Brown, who I also believe should, uh, while these allegations stand, should step aside from caucus, uh, I believe, uh, while these allegations stand, he should completely resign from, uh, should completely uh, step aside from... But from, from the party. So he stepped down from one level down to another. To me, he should, he should step aside. But he hasn't. So can you fire him? Do you have the authority to do that? No. And this is, this is a, you know, sort of the, uh, the structure constitutionally. We have an executive a branch, and we have no control over that executive. So that's hmm. the same executive that we went to and said, our caucus had a unanimous vote. Uh, I'm the interim leader. They expect me to go all the way to the election. Uh, it was that executive that said, we... Uh, want a uh, full leadership review. Again, I, I fully respect the decision. They are a, another branch that has uh, 
uh, different powers than we have. So that's their choice to do that. Okay. Um, Greg Lyle, again, from the Innovative Research Group, brought these new fresh polling numbers out. And one of the things that I think truly astonished all the people who got this briefing, and there were, I don't know, about 50 to 75 of us in the room there, the polls have barely moved at all since all of this stuff came out. Uh, you guys had, I think, about a two-point lead over the Liberals among decided voters in Lyle's polling before all of this happened. And afterwards, you had a four-point bulge your lead actually increased. And Sheldon, can you bring up graphic three here? I don't know if you've seen this yet. Uh, Greg Lyle asked people, do you approve or disapprove of the way that the PC party has responded to all of the accusations against Patrick Brown? And by you know a two to one margin, people seem to appreciate the way that the party has responded to all of what's happened. Can you explain any of that to me? How, in spite of all of this, I mean, this is a party with no leader and this is a, you know, uh, sorry, I don't mean, I mean, you're here, but there's no, permanent <laughs> leader, there's no permanent leader in place. How is it possible that this has not somehow changed dramatically popular support for the parties right now? Well, they're asking us, uh, do, you, do you approve of what we did uh, <laughs> since uh, last Wednesday, so more than a week ago? And I think people saw that we were uh, decisive that there really is uh, no room in society uh, any longer for these kinds of accusations. Mm -hmm. Some would think we went too far. Some would think we didn't go far enough. So I think the fact that we were decisive and showed them this is what happened, this is what we did about it, and here's who we are today. And I think that's the same opinion of what I have been doing in, in, in the last, just these last few days, mm -hmm. We have issues. Here's what we're doing about them. What we're doing about them, and here's where it will take us. And I would expect that to, for people to say, okay, you 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 showed us what's happening. We may not like what happened, but we approve of how you're managing this crisis. Two more quick things here. Have you talked to Patrick Brown since he resigned as leader? No, you have not. No. Will you reach out to him? Um, I have, through the media, said I think he should step aside, and I, I hope he hears that message. But I think he needs some time on his own. I, I really genuinely do. If he comes to you and says, Vic, uh, appreciate your concern, but I'd like to stand for the PC party, uh, you know, in my hometown uh, and run in the next election, do you have the authority not to sign his nomination papers? At this point, I do have that authority. Will you exercise it? Oh, absolutely. I would not sign. I have said, as long as these allegations stand, I would not sign his nomination papers, period. One last thing. Uh, again, after all of my checking about, there seem to be two schools of thought on this. One, your party is in a whole heap of trouble because of this disarray. Two, your party is going to absolutely dominate the headlines for the next few months, and if you get your act together, you might actually be able to shock the world. What do you have to do to ensure it's the latter and not the former? I believe it will be the latter. I genuinely do. The, the, some uh, of the uh, government may be uh, uh, chuckling and, and saying, I can't wait for, to throw these words back in their face. I think the people, of, from what I've received so far, I think the people of Ontario, certainly our members, are saying, Wow, uh, this is different for politics. Uh, you know, a party that's uh, telling us the issues, all the problems, uh, telling us how they're going to fix it. I think they're going to look at that and say, you know what? That's how they're going to manage Ontario. They're going to be open, transparent, and honest. And we now see that they know how to fix things. And by gosh, they're going to fix Ontario. I'm going to give them my support. I believe that's going to happen. You just put a huge target on your back, as you know. If this convention turns out to be a dog's breakfast because the yeah. computers break down or whatever, I mean, you've, you've invited the scrutiny. I'm a, I'm a business person. I, you know, the, these are the things that uh, you deal with in business every day. Mm -hmm. uh, the target is already there, Steve. It <laughs> wouldn't have mattered what I say. Uh, you know, that's why immediately I've put all of these fail-safe systems. We've, you know, we've stopped... Uh, this spending, we've uh, capped this, we put a ceiling on that. We've, uh, I, I took the list of, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, from, our, uh, uh, from my chief of staff of, of some of the resources that maybe we need to move. 
I uh, gave him the blessing, uh, didn't ask or, uh, for any changes to be made to that list. These are decisive things that are happening. I think people are going to acknowledge that. We gave the fund, or we gave the, the leadership committee all the money they asked for to the penny. Uh, this, is, this, is, uh, this is their committee. I don't sit on it. I don't direct them. Uh, I just need to make sure that the money is there for them and the resources are there for them. And I'm pushing everything I can to them for them to have a successful convention. The three most cliched words in journalism. Time will tell. <laughs> Vic Fidelli, we thank you very much for coming into TVO tonight and answering our questions. It's always a pleasure, Steve. I enjoy being here. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.